This is Techno, a show about innovations that can change lives. The science of fighting a wildfire. We're going to explore the intersection of hardware and humanity, and we're doing it in a unique way. This is a show about science. Oh, oh my God. <laughs> by scientists. Tonight, Techno investigates vaping. Whoever bought this got way more than they bargained for. <laughs> yes, they did. It's everywhere in clubs, street corners, and cars. They say it's safe and can help break the cigarette habit. If I had to say what is more dangerous, honestly, they're equal. But what's really inside those e-cigs? You never know what you're getting. Dr. Crystal Dilworth is a neuroscientist who specializes in nicotine studies. She'll bring us the latest research. What happens to your lungs when those metal particles go into them? Marita Davison is an environmental biologist they're going to be around the corner. They went through there really quick, but we got them. She's off the coast of California, where drones are taking some incredible images of migrating whales. As this technology becomes available to more people, um, we're going to see more researchers using it. I'm Phil Torres. I'm an entomologist. That's our team. Now let's do some science. Hey guys, welcome to Techno. I'm Phil Torres, joined by Marita Davison and Dr. Crystal Dilworth. Now, bigger and potentially more dangerous, that's the best way to describe what's happening with this smoking alternative known as e-cigarettes or vaping. It's an industry that seems to really be exploding. I mean, you're seeing it everywhere. And a part of me wonders if this might be because of some misinformation about vaping. That's, that's my sense. And our Dr. Crystal Dilworth, you have your PhD in nicotine studies, so we've asked you to keep a tab on this. There's a lot of academic research that's being done on the safety of use of these devices, but it can't really keep up with the growing industry. I enjoy the taste of it and not get the harmful effects of what smoking does. Call them vapors or foggers or competitive cloud chasers. All are welcome at Crystal Vapor, one of thousands of vape shops across the country. Since Techno first reported on the vaping phenomenon in 2013, the industry has taken off like wildfire. Revenue is estimated to reach $3.5 billion this year, doubling since 2013. According to a recent poll, 10% of all American adults are vaping. That's an estimated 20 million people. When it comes to kids, while conventional tobacco smoking among them is dropping to record lows, e-cigarettes are a growing concern at the Centers for Disease Control. Between 2013 and 2014 alone, we saw a tripling in use among U.S. high school students um, to the point where it was about 13.5% of U.S. high school students had used these products within the past 30 days. From the early generation of cigarette lookalikes Techno first reported on, personal vaporizing devices known as mods have gone high tech. Vaping's come a long way, baby. We've seen the shift move from pens and tanks, at least culturally, to what we call cloud chasing devices. Went from mech mods, mechanical mods, to basically box mods is what's going on right now. It may sound confusing, but the basic mechanics are pretty simple. There's a battery-powered atomizer that heats up a liquid mixture known as juice and turns it into vapor, which the user inhales. When we first met researcher Monique Williams, she'd wrapped up a study that found harmful metal particulates in the vapor from earlier models of e-cigarettes. Following the evolution of the industry, she's updating her study. So the original study, we had looked at a cartomizer-style e-cigarette, and uh, we had detected um, high amounts of tin present in the cartomizer parts. Do you still finding heavy metal particulate in the vapor? We are still finding that, yes. That's really scary, because that's going into people's lungs. Mm -hmm. What happens to your lungs when those metal particles go into them? Inhalation of metal, uh, especially things like tin, can cause um, stenosis, and that could constrict the bronchioles and you know the airways in the lungs. Across the hall at UC Riverside, they're studying one of those compounds. Researcher Alana Cordova is focused on nicotine concentrations in refillable e-cig liquids. In this case, the solution tested is Tennessee Cured by Red Oak, a fluid made by Johnson Creek Enterprises, an online seller of e-liquids and Accessories. We order a bunch of them and just run most of them just to test the accuracy of the label. And in this case, this is 18 micrograms per milliliter. So this would be considered a high nicotine concentration. Okay. So the, the test here is we'll see how much it's measuring from this peak and then we'll compare that to what's on the label. 
And as you can see from our control, it was a lot higher. So we know for sure that it is nicotine. And in a recent paper that we published, we found out that this specific sample was 59% higher nicotine than its advertised label. Whoever bought this got way more than they bargained for. <laughs> yes, they did. Techno asked Johnson Creek Enterprises about its nicotine labeling discrepancy. They offered this statement. Between 2011 and 2012, there was a noticeable improvement in our manufacturing processes, including in-process controls and analytical methods for testing nicotine concentration with greater accuracy. While the company's stated claims point to a step in the right direction, the red oak sample that they manufactured with the 59% higher nicotine discrepancy was purchased for the UC Riverside study online in February 2012, well within the range of Johnson Creek's stated internal improvements in controls and accuracy. But they're not alone. Currently, UC Riverside is evaluating a new batch of liquids from a variety of vendors, and preliminary results continue to suggest large discrepancies in nicotine labeling throughout the industry. Just based on all the research that we've done, you never know what you're getting. It could be higher nicotine concentration, it could be lower, and although lower might sound better, that's going to mean that you need to smoke more just to get what your body is normally used to. Researchers are also concerned about the content of the hundreds of flavored liquids that fuel vaping. Our number one seller is uh, Looper from Animal, and this is a, uh, a cereal Fruit Loops flavor with a little bit of milk. Ah. <laughs> A lot of these flavors that are regarded as grass, G-R-A-S, generally regarded as safe. That is a term that's given to flavoring products that can be ingested. What's happening to these flavoring products when they're being aerosolized at these high temperatures and inhaled into the lungs? You have chemical reactions that can break them down into a lot more toxic chemicals known as carbonyl compounds. Um, prime example being formaldehyde. That's a very common one. Everyone's heard of formaldehyde. And everyone should know formaldehyde isn't good for you. So in head-to-head -head comparison, e-cigs versus is conventional cigarette, which one do you think is healthier? My opinion, I think they're both dangerous. I think the narrative that most people are missing is that the public health opponents to vapor have lumped in vapor with the evil tobacco folks that they fought, you know, back in the 80s and the 90s. And so they've decided that this is the exact same thing. Cynthia Cabrera is the executive director for the Smoke-Free Alternative Trade Association called Safada a vaping lobby group. We need to dispel the idea that these products, vapor products, are the same as combusted tobacco products because they're not. So we need to look at any time that anyone is using a vapor product, they're not smoking. And that's a win for everybody. These e-cigarettes, they don't contain the 7,000 plus chemicals that conventional cigarettes have, and that's always a plus. But on the flip side, they do have their own set of compounds that you're being exposed to. Unfortunately, we're gonna have to wait for the longevity studies, but if, if I had to say what is more dangerous, honestly, I, they're, they're equal. To me, they're equal. The Food and Drug Administration, which regulates tobacco, is still reviewing vaping regulations. Travis Paget has been smoking since high school. Today, he vapes to cut down on tobacco use. For me, it was, yeah, it was just, it kind of started out as like a different way to get my nicotine. Now a microbiology major at UC Riverside, Travis is vaping for science, participating in a study that measures his intake, puff duration, volume, and frequency. When you get out of here, you're gonna have a science degree. Why not wait for science? Why, why vape now before we know if it's safe? Well, I mean, it's either I vape or I smoke cigarettes. And we already know cigarettes are bad. It's a roll of the dice. Exactly, it's a roll of the dice. <laughs> The people that are choosing vaping over conventional cigarettes are choosing the unknown over the known. They know that conventional cigarettes are going to give them cancer. There's a chance that vaping is better, and so they're rolling the dice with that. But they're still gambling with their own health. And sometimes adults are making more informed decisions, but then you have all these kids trying. Well, absolutely. I mean, adolescents, they're still in a stage of brain development. They're not as capable as adults of making good decisions, and they're uniquely susceptible to addiction. And usually, we've got regulations in place that help protect for specifically those kind of cases, but here, it's so new, you know, the regulations aren't, they haven't kept up. Obviously, that's a major concern. All of the regulations and protections that we have developed for tobacco products, conventional cigarettes, are not there when it comes to vaping. Well, guys, fascinating topic, and I'm sure, Krista, you'll keep us up to date on this, but coming up next, Marita, I understand you went whale watching. I did. I got to go whale watching using drones in the sky, so a little bit like spying, but it's a great way to observe whales that we normally wouldn't be able to see, and we don't really disturb them at all. 
Most times when you see images from a drone, something is exploding, usually devastation from the air. These are the military drones in service around the world. Closer to home in California, they're also used for important peacetime missions, like assisting firefighters by mapping out hotspots during raging wildfires. Much has been reported about the use of drones, especially when it comes to military applications. Drones may even become the delivery system for consumer goods. But today, off the coast of San Simeon, California, researchers are using drones, like this one here behind me, for a spectacular use, all in the name of science. This is the Piedras Blancas light station. This is a very unique piece of property because it sticks out into the migratory corridor of the northbound gray whale cows and calves. A picture-perfect location for researchers to fly a science drone to get an unprecedented bird's eye view of what swims below. The right of six, okay. but in the distant foam line. I gotcha. Low. 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 There it is. Oh, yeah. Yeah. For 22 years, Wayne Perryman and a team from NOAA have been here from March until May, counting and collecting data on gray whales migrating north, from the breeding grounds of Mexico to the Arctic, a trip of 6,800 miles. This point is kind of a focal point for them, and we're able to see them very, very well. They pass often within 100 meters of the beach, so it's wow. a great place to count animals. Gray whales swim close to land as protection against their main predator, killer whales. Even so, it takes a sharp eye and strong binoculars to spot the northern migration. Once they do, it's go time for a one-of-a-kind unmanned aircraft named Mobley. To the right, to the right. Okay, now move. They're in the middle of the frame. They're right there. Keep on going up. Hold on, hold on. And they're surfacing in the middle of the frame. Good. Come down a little bit. How's that? They're moving to the right. I see them underwater. NOAA scientist and pilot John Durbin is tracking a mother and her calf from a distance of about three quarters of a mile out from where he stands. John's wife and co-researcher, Holly Fernbach, is under the towel that shades a control panel, giving her a real-time video feed that aids in guiding the flight. So when they come up next, I'm going to move out to them, yeah, OK? picking up more kelp at the very right edge. Should be perfect. Let's see where they are. Now it's split-second timing for John to remotely trigger the camera to take high-definition photographs of the whales. I think they're going to be around the corner. They went through there really quick, but we got okay. them. We did well there, huh? Yep. This is really a tool we have for flying a camera. You know, we're trying to make inference about size and shape of whales by taking photographs. It's called photogrammetry. So this is our camera, and we want to get it above the whales. Mobley was built by Don Leroy at a cost of $25,000. It may look like a hobbyist dream project, but in fact, it's packed with many high-tech systems to do science. So it's called a hexacopter because it has six motors and six rotors. If it's not being told what to do, it wants to hover. Okay. It wants to be stable in the air. The high-definition photos taken from the eye in the sky give scientists a better look at the overall health of the whales. A female has been eating a lot and she's fat. Her width relative to her length will be different than a female who hasn't eaten very much. So we can take just those two measurements, and with those two, we can get an index of condition, index of fatness for that female. Perryman says this season, many of the northbound lactating female gray whales observed appeared more robust than in previous years. Data that is important for many reasons. Whale health gives scientists a snapshot of the balancing act between food sources, natural predators, even climate change. We're getting to the point now where we really can talk about how climate change in the Arctic is impacting this population. Now that there's less ice and it's thinner, there's more photosynthesis going on in the wintertime because light can penetrate. And what we want to do is kind of understand that dynamic of what's going on. Recently, John Durbin and the NOAA team took Mobley to Canada to study killer whales. Taken from 100 feet above, this video, the first of its kind, gives scientists a clear picture of the health of northern resident killer whales. In these images, the whale on the right appears robust and in good condition, while the whale on the left is thin and in poor health. 
scientists believe this whale later died because it was no longer spotted with its pod. On the little guy? Okay. Well, the big guy should be here somewhere. Killer whales are important because they're competing with us for fish. We're trying to understand are they getting enough food. As this technology becomes available to more people, um, we're going to see more researchers using it. Is it safe for research? Is it safe for the animals? I think it's a win-win. From an emotional perspective, just being able to see these incredibly beautiful species out in their natural environment, we'd never be able to do that. And otherwise. we don't have to disturb them to see them. But in terms of the overarching story, I mean, as scientists, you can collect data on two things, what is and what's changing. And it seems like this method allows them to collect data that's sort of speaking to both of those objectives. They're studying what is now, and when things change, we'll know. Yeah, and I mean, that also speaks to the importance of having these long-term data sets, right? Because you have to be able to establish a baseline, which I think they're doing very well, you know, with 22 years worth of data. And now with, with the changes of climate change, you know, that, um, that's a really powerful set of data to, to give us a sense of what's, what's on the horizon. You are going to tell us about a unique tour you took of a little unusual lab in Detroit. Yeah, you know, it's basically a lab full of trash, and Ford invited us to check out the ways that they're making the auto industry a little bit greener. So clearly a lot of environmental incentives here at play. Yeah, you know, obviously when you use recycled materials over new ones, you're going to be saving a little bit of money. But they also have found some new ways to solve some old problems using some very cool methods. So let's take a look. It's taken over a century, but today car manufacturers are getting into high gear when it comes to going green. From hydrogen fuel cell cars to electric plug-ins and hybrids, mileage is going up. And with at least 10% of a vehicle's environmental impact in the assembly process, manufacturing is going green too. Companies like Toyota, GM, Volkswagen, Ford, and Honda are all stepping up eco-friendly methods with zero waste factories diverting millions of pounds from landfills, reusing water, recycling sludge, and going solar powered. And it's not just assembly. Take Ford. 85% of its cars are renewable, recyclable, or compostable. Everything from recyclable aluminum bodies and engine parts to soy foam seats and fabrics made from 5 million recycled plastic bottles. And this is where the ideas percolate the Materials Research Lab at Ford Headquarters in Dearborn, Michigan. What would you say is the craziest thing that you guys work with? What do you think those are? They look kind of gross. Yeah, so these are cigarette filters. And it's a cellulose acetate fiber. And look so we're looking at that. that fiber as a reinforcement for plastics. Debbie Molesky started the lab back in 2001 with soy foam. Oil was about $40 a barrel. And so nobody saw a reason to use plant-based materials, even though there was an environmental improvement. Um, when we launched our soy-based foams, oil was above $150 a barrel. And so suddenly, what was a very poorly received idea was very well received. Instead of a petroleum base, the foam in every seat in North America is made of Michigan soy. And now the lab is testing algae oil with its more global reach. Plastics researcher Ellen Lee gave Techno the first public look at this newest experimental foam. I'm gonna have you add in a surfactant, this one. And that kind of acts like the egg and a mayonnaise to blend everything okay. together. And then I'm gonna have you add the blowing agent, which in our case is water. I'm gonna mix this up. And, and then we'll see the foam start to react. Whoa, and there it goes. It's baking into a cake. So you can see all the gas bubbles already forming. We use this to kind of evaluate our formulation and how fast it comes up. Why is it important that this reacts fast? How fast you can meet, make each part is really important for manufacturing because you want to be able to make things in a timely manner. Are we talking a matter of minutes per foam seed or seconds here? Less than a minute. Ford is aiming to make their plastics at least 20% bio-based. Is this actually making the plastic stronger? Yes, it does. These parts are lighter in weight. I can show you one that is made from hemp versus glass, and it's about a 30% weight reduction. So if we continue to do this, we will improve fuel economy as well. 
Ford says it's already diverted more than 30 million pounds of plastic from North American landfills with materials as diverse as wheatgrass, coconut hair, shredded jeans, and millions of dollars of old greenbacks. What a lot of people don't know is money isn't actually paper. It's a blend of cotton and linen. So we're trying to grind it down into a smaller, finer grind. Research engineer Giuseppe Lacaria showed me how it's done. So let's grind some money. We're going to use a cryo grinder. There's a shuttle that goes inside, and using magnets, it turns the magnets on and off, and it'll move the shuttle back and forth between the two metal ends. Here it'll smash the money using liquid nitrogen around it. And why do you put liquid nitrogen in? So liquid nitrogen will just cool the money down to a brittle so it's easy to smash. And uh, we'll turn on the machine. Oh, but these aren't the uh, yeah. Look at that. Powdered money. Then it's melted in with plastic and formed into pellets. You melt them down and then you form them into things like this. Right. And this is a coin tray. That is a coin tray. Ford's money. putting money back into your vehicle. What is this? Tomato fibers. So these are actual skins, leaves, and stems from the tomato plants from Heinz's ketchup production. They process millions of pounds of tomatoes every year and they have a lot of leftover. Why is this a good product for you guys to use? We can use this to reinforce our plastics to make them stiffer but then at the same time reduce our impact. The lab is in the very early stages of testing the tomato-based possibilities, making samples by melting and mixing plastic, extruding it into pellets and molds for testing. You would mention part of the test is actually the smell. You know if they're driving along they may not want to smell tomatoes because they might get hungry. So what's your big end goal for all of this? We all have kids, and we want to make sure that there's a green, nice planet for them with materials that they can continually replenish. I don't want them to depend on petroleum as their only source of materials. Sitting between you guys is, of course, $10,000 worth of cash, but unfortunately it is old cash shredded, would normally go to the trash, but in this case, they're reusing it and making coin trays out of it. This idea of closing the materials loop, you know, going as much as we possibly can towards zero waste in manufacturing, it's not just lip service anymore, it's happening and it makes total business sense. I think it's so interesting to see like the tr cross industry collaboration like Heinz Ketchup and Ford Motors like these aren't really two companies that I would think would work together in this way. I mean, I as a chemist, I think a lot about it as like green chemistry like you want all of the byproducts of your chemical reactions to be used in further reactions and that's kind of like how I think about it. But this is really creative. And that's why you're Dr. Crystal. <laughs> that's Dover. why. I'm I think for me in the past my only ketchup and car interactions were when I spilled ketchup yeah. in my car. We've all been there. From the California coast all the way over to Detroit, we've covered a lot of ground today, guys, and covered some pretty interesting topics. So, thanks for that. We'll have a lot more for you next time on Techno. We'll see you then. Dive deep into these stories and go behind the scenes at aljazeera.com slash techno. Follow our expert contributors on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, Google Plus, and more.